All right. Uh, is everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's okay. Excellent. Um, so my name is Rob Rennick from Ontario. So I'm going to be kicking off our uh, discussion here today on uh, mobile information uh, provision for travelers. Uh, after I talk, we're going to have uh, Ted from Emirates and Michael Pack from Cat Lab both uh, speaking in, uh, in some, some order after me. Um, so I'm going to uh, go through uh, this and uh, uh, look, at, look at travel information on mobile devices from a really uh, kind of a practical level. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about it largely in kind of a 511 uh, context and what's going on uh, for a lot of the states and uh, regional agencies that are our clients who are thinking about how to uh, deliver essentially the next generation of 511 solutions and how does that <coughs> translate to, to mobile devices. I'm going to talk about some of the issues that, um, that that's brought up for our clients at least in terms of thinking about thinking about the mobile space and travel information um, uh, and talk a little bit about um, you know what are the, some of the design solutions that uh, we're working on and that others are working on to figure out how to make uh, make uh, travel information work on mobile devices uh, just to give you a basic sense this is uh, iteris does a lot of 511 uh, work this actually isn't the main thing i do um, but we do, we run a lot of 511 systems for various uh, states around the country. This is a, a listing of our clients. Um, uh, we sort of probably have the majority of 501 installations out there. And what you're seeing happening is a uh, real transition in uh, the 501 space, uh, largely driven by mobile devices. Um, and really, uh, what's, what's happened is driven by uh, the private sector, of course. There have been these new mobile ways of getting travel information over the last few years uh, that have really made states step back and start to think about, well, what am I doing uh, in my 511 provision? What do I need to do in the future uh, for my traveling public? One of the big changes is that uh, the states have been, uh, public agencies have really been focused on uh, pulling data from specific source, which is essentially infrastructure sensors. Uh, things like loop detectors, and radar detectors on the roadway has been a big traditional source of 501 data uh, for agencies over the last few, uh, ever since really 501 came into existence. And of course, as we know, increasingly, uh, the, the sources for this are now coming from mobile devices, right? So there's now uh, an ecosystem of companies that will sell as a state, sell you exactly this detailed information about um, what's going on in your system based on mobile devices. And so really mobile devices and this kind of mobile channel for states have become both a challenge in terms of how to present the data and an opportunity in terms of how to gather the data. Another big challenge for agencies out there in the, um, in the mobile uh, 501 space is really revenue generation. And so what's happened over the last few years in the 511 world is that um, because of a lot of larger political forces and agency forces, uh, 511 has increasingly become uh, viewed in uh, the agency world as uh, something that should be essentially revenue neutral. And so a lot of the agencies are stopping or slowing their investments in their 511 system and looking, in fact, to recoup their operational investments from revenue generation. Uh, Georgia DOT was a real uh, a leader in this. Uh, this, is, this is one of our clients um, that has attempted to essentially build a revenue neutral model for their overall 501 system. And one of the key pieces of that uh, from a mobile perspective is that uh, a lot of the traditional 501 by its very nature is telephony, right? It's, it's people calling in, uh, calling 511 and hearing what's happening. That's much more expensive than people going to a mobile device and looking at what's happening on the device. And so increasingly, agencies are thinking about um, what are the ways in which we can actually drive our 501 traffic from our telephony system, which is, which is very expensive to maintain, to a much cheaper uh, mobile system. Um, so there's, there's these kind of dual pressures of mobile is uh, a lot cheaper to operate. And on the flip side, um, it's very hard for uh, state agencies to generate significant revenue 
uh, on the mobile side of, of the world. And so this is really a big issue for them uh, from a mobile sense. Um, the, the, the only assets that have generated significant revenue for our clients have been physical assets, in general signage along the roadway. Uh, the mobile app assets, typically uh, commercial partners who want to come in and, and do things on mobile want a much larger market than a state or a city. You know, they're looking more at national markets generally you know, where they invest their dollars. Um, so that's kind of the context of what's happening in the mobile space. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about some visuals of um, you know, what's out there. One of the things that um, our, a lot of our clients are trying to think about how to do uh, given the increased kind of commercialization of this area is to, uh, to, you know, to send richer data that they have out through their distribution partners uh, to the traveling public. Uh, this is a good example of some of the richer data that some, some agencies are collecting on travel time reliability information. This is just a simple example of a route between our offices at, at iTerrace in Berkeley and uh, Silicon Valley that goes through San Francisco. Um, and this is a little data visualization of some of the data that agencies have now on travel time reliability. So this is if you left on that route at 8 a.m. from Berkeley towards Silicon Valley. These are the different travel times you would achieve as you went along that route. The higher travel times are to the right, and the faster travel times are to the left. And so agencies actually have, so some agencies actually have this kind of sophisticated uh, probability density function, essentially, of all the possible travel times uh, on a given route uh, that the travelers can traverse. And in this example, uh, you can actually model what this, what this uh, density function looks like. Uh, that's what this little red line is showing. And you can put it in context of an entire day. So this little uh, probably density function we're looking at here on the bottom is just what happens if you leave at 8 a.m. Um, but of course, that's just one slice of a larger day of travel times. That's represented by this circular, this polar uh, plot on the top here. And you can actually see the kind of rich data that you could communicate to someone who is thinking about making this trip. Um, you, you can see, you can show them, okay, well, if you travel, you know, here during the off-peak at mid, you know, midnight or at noon, you're going to have a very, a much shorter trip that's more tightly distributed. So you're much more likely to have a trip that's consistent consistent travel experience. Whereas if you travel during one of the peaks, maybe the AM peak or the PM peak, that probability density function is going to move outward and spread out. And by moving outward, that means it's going to take longer in general. And by spreading out here, that means it's going to be less consistent in general. And so one of the ways that we think about this particular chart is as a next generation type uh, interface. Uh, in terms of thinking about how you would think about two different routes that you could take. So these two routes here, the, the one on top is the one that we just talked about from Berkeley to Silicon Valley. The one on the bottom is the same origin and destination, Berkeley to Silicon Valley, but a different route, kind of sneaking around the back way instead of going through San Francisco. And what you can see here is these are two very different routes in terms of uh, the types of travel characteristics you're likely to get. And so you see this lower route much more tightly distributed. It's a little longer in general. The circle's a little bit wider than the circle on top, and so that means this route is a little longer in general. But it's much more tightly distributed. It doesn't flatten out during the peaks, right? It's very tightly distributed around the peaks. You can see there's a little bit of flattening in the PM peak here, um, not really in the AM. Um, and so if you're a traveler, the practical way uh, to look at this information and understand it is to say, well, if I'm traveling during uh, you know, a, a rush hour period, I probably should take this route number two on the bottom because that's going to be a more consistent experience. And if I'm going uh, during a non-rush hour period, I probably want to take uh, route number one, um, you know, which is, is shorter during the non-rush hour. So this is the kind of data increasingly that agencies have to show in uh, mobile devices and other displays. Um, but the key question is how do you boil that down, that data down, um, to something that's usable, um, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit in terms of the, the, the trends in, in mobile design that we see out there. The, um, the other side of this is increasingly agencies are looking at uh, building uh, mobile
mobile applications uh, for their customers as a means of uh, getting data in as well. And so this is increasingly common that agencies can actually put out mobile devices and pull data back uh, from those devices. We call them the breadcrumbs. So you know you typically get data every few seconds of vehicle positions and speeds. And so we worked on this with clients in, in the travel information context to actually start pulling this data back and feeding their own data systems uh, going forward. This is just an example of what that data looks like when you plot it out. This is all the data uh, for one city for one day. Essentially plotted as these little breadcrumbs as the vehicles drive through, drive through the routes. Um, and increasingly, agencies are getting more sophisticated about how to uh, visualize this data to turn it into useful information on a segment by segment. What you see here are different levels of what we call kind of smearing the data out. So this is if you, you just look at a kind of rolling two minute time horizon, the one on the right is you look at an hour in terms of figuring out what the speeds are on, on a given network. And so increasingly, what we see is there's a lot of issues that are pushing agencies towards mobile uh, just from a pure practical business case perspective. Uh, the things I talked about kind of in the first section. And then in addition to that, um, there's a lot of advantages to having mobile apps out in the wild uh, for agencies to actually go uh, get more data about their customers. And not just this type of traffic data, but also a lot of data about what their customers uh, like and don't like about the transportation uh, system. So one of the things that we do at ITERS is we build uh, kind of a white label uh, we have a white label mobile application platform for 501. This showing here two examples, one from Virginia Department of Transportation. Uh, on the left, this is the VDOT 511 app. If you go download that from the app store, this is what you get. The one on the right is another example of one we've done out uh, here more locally for uh, San Diego. And so this one actually, I think, is not quite released yet. But you know, someday soon, if you go search for San Diego 511 in the App Store on either Android Play or uh, iTunes, uh, you'll be able to download this. This uh, San Diego one is a good example of uh, the agency thinking very uh, carefully about how to uh, put out mobile apps for their traveling public that harmonize with what they're trying to do from a system management perspective. This one has a lot of extra data and uh, kind of polling back around the integrated corridor management project that San Diego has been doing with federal money on um, I-15. Here, if you look there, you can see those little fast track toll tag signs showing some of the extra data about that that San Diego invested in um, uh, to, uh, uh, to make this happen. You know, one of the things, uh, we haven't moved the name, although you can figure it out. It's not an Android app that I'm criticizing here. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we've done in a lot of uh, uh, usability uh, studies on um, uh, what's out there now with mobile apps, and I'll end on just talking a little bit about um, what we see as kind of future in, in the mobile area, which is that a lot of the complexity um, and, and the challenge on the interface side. So, you know, we, we just looked at a lot of data sources, and there's a lot of complexity there that we think is good, and we think we can find helpful ways to communicate with customers about that complexity. But what you really need to do is then boil that down and reduce it on the front end. And so this is an example of what it takes to add a route in an unnamed uh, mobile app, that's a commercial mobile app, uh, if you're a customer. And the, the types of technologies that we've been uh, working on, uh, The types of uh, technologies that we've been working on are more along the lines of these context-aware uh, systems that are increasingly coming into mobile devices. So uh, just for people who don't know, uh, in the latest build, essentially the latest releases of both Android and iOS devices, increasingly what's happening is you're getting a full processor that's dedicated to what's called context awareness. And so that's things like, you know, is what's the user doing right now? Are they twisting the phone in this way or that way? They have little motion sensors to figure out that's going on. Better low power GPS sensors 
uh, always on microphones, uh, that's a fun feature, uh, that's figuring out what's the context, the background context of go what's going on with that particular user. The way that we see this translating in the mobile space is really um, that uh, what you can do with that is uh, create a context aware uh, type of travel information experience. This is a case where, for example, uh, this is showing an interface that we've built um, that will let you uh, figure out ahead of time, actually let you look at ahead of time and say, uh, what is uh, my commute, my commute to my office? What does that look like today? So here you can see it's showing red. It means that's you know a bad commute, obviously worse, worse than average commute. Um, and it shows you know, the number of minutes and things like that. The key to this is that uh, no user ever has to put in what is their route to the office because the app uh, just sits around for a couple of weeks and based on where the user travels, figures out where is your home and where is your office from what the user is doing using the context awareness in the devices. And so we really think this is the future of mobile app design because we think increasingly consumers are going to demand the ability not to have to enter their routes one by one. They're just going to want to have that, uh, that be automatically figured out by the app. And so that's essentially what's happening here. And then this app is just showing, OK, here's the automatic screen that pops up once you're driving. The app can sense that you started on your trip to the office. It knows where your office is. And it can start telling you, OK, well, you're right here on this trip. And here's what's coming up. And it's just focused on that trip you're taking, not about all the other uh, data around that. We sort of think of the mobile app space in three generations. Uh, UI design, the first generation uh, being just kind of, you know, maps uh, on, a, on, a, on a phone of some sort. The second generation being more uh, what the current uh, user experience is like, which is more navigation oriented. And then we think of this generation as being more context aware. And so um, instead of just telling you, okay, here are your directions, here's where you need to turn next, it tells you a lot more about your whole entire journey that you're taking. And so this is, this, these are the trends that we see from a practical agency perspective and on the private sector in terms of where, where we think uh, mobile app design and visualization is going to go uh, for travel information stuff. And with that, I'll take uh, questions. So do you develop both for Apple and Android? Uh, we haven't had a client yet that has had us do only one. So we always okay. do both, uh, and there's no other platforms that we develop for. We actually don't even have expertise to develop on other platforms anymore. Is this geared for an end user as a general public, or is it more for like delivery drivers or haul trucks and like that? We think this will be a general consumer type of interface uh, in the near future. The if you look at the interfaces that are more for like telematics purposes and then, you know, delivery schedules and things like that. They tend to be more complex, they tend to be bigger, um, and they tend to be less polished. You know, that's, that's the general difference between that. But what we see as well is a lot of agencies taking interests, for example, I talked about, you know, pulling data back, um, pulling it back from their uh, uh, service vehicles as well. So how do you get more and more data that you can feed into kind of the overall data engine as an agency? Can't help but ask the question like how, uh, what are the improvements there over the regular Google Maps? Well, so that's that's a big challenge that agencies face in general is they started all these travel information services, 511 services, in the days before uh, you know you have these these third party vendors come in and, and start giving this data away for free. We do both public sector and private sector work for this, this platform that we do. So we do both kinds of work. We're kind of neutral on these types of questions of, you know, should you be doing this as a public sector agency? A lot of what we advise them to do is um, to, to do, um, uh, try to, if they're going to do some sort of travel information experience, use it to get closer to the traveling public somehow, to get more insight into what they're doing. Because if they just do it as a pure, public information service, you know, there are all these other systems, so what's the point of that? If you're going to build a mobile application, use that mobile application to get data back about what's going on with the travelers on your network and what they want, because that's often a big challenge for agencies to figure that out. And that's something that mobile apps can offer 
that a phone service is much more difficult to offer. I mean, on the 501 services that we run, the telephony services that we run, we have like, you know, voicemail complaint boxes, right? So, you, you know, there's that service. But it's often a lot more useful to get kind of real-time journey feedback or things like that from travelers as they use your system. And so uh, we did a talk yesterday about crowdsourcing from social media. This is kind of akin to that. How do you crowdsource from people traveling around your system to get data back? So yeah, I mean, I think the, the other main thing that we say to agencies is uh, put all your data out on open interfaces as well. So a lot of agencies that try to own the end user experience by keeping their data in a silo and not giving that out to third parties. And we think those days you know, are over. You should really put the data out on open interfaces as well. Let people build whatever they want to build. All right, the self monitor. I'll kick myself out. Thank you very much. So I'm Ted Trepreneur with Enrix, and I'll do a little self introduction while Michael hooks up the, the laptop. So, um, Enrix is a private sector provider of traffic data and, and mobile applications. Um, so, we'll talk more about that in the presentation. My personal background is I've uh, been with Enrix a little over three years. And prior to that, I was with the Washington State Department of Transportation. Um, I was their director of traffic operations there um, before I left. It's with them 26 years in total. Um, and this whole traveler information space was a big part of what we, what we worked on there and one of the things I was in charge of. And one of the things that excited me about the move to Enrix was really being able to harness um, the big data and move out from just one place into a lot, a lot broader um, perspective. And so we've got a um, video that I want to start with that kind of tees up the discussion today about the distribution of mobile information and why we do it. What are you happiest in life? Most likely, it isn't while being stuck in traffic. At Enrix, we believe that traffic shouldn't slow you down, so we created a better way to go. In 2005, we pioneered a breakthrough approach to traffic by analyzing data from the vehicles themselves. We can provide traffic information from everywhere, on every street. Crowdsourcing was born. We continue to innovate, dramatically improving the accuracy of traffic information on city streets and other local roads. The result is better routes and more accurate travel times that help drivers navigate around the day's jams. This approach changed the industry, and soon we were collaborating with leading automakers, including Ford, Toyota, Audi, and BMW. Governments started using our data to improve daily operations and build our future highways. News media started using our information for up-to-the-minute traffic reporting. Today, you can find us in a variety of products and services, from Pioneer to MapQuest to Windermere. Our breakthrough technologies continue to change the game. We can predict traffic conditions hours and days in advance. We've created Enrix Traffic, a free mobile app offering drivers up-to-the-minute traffic information, accident and incident reports, recommended departure times, and the ability to share your arrival time with friends and family. Enrix has always been at the cutting edge, empowering drivers to be smarter commuters and more sophisticated adventurers. Today, our benefits go beyond traffic. We help drivers find the closest and cheapest gas no matter where they are, and the least expensive available parking spot when they get where they're going. 
We're a leading provider of traffic information and driver services worldwide. Our growing global network covers 32 countries, almost 2 million miles of road in North America, and more than 1 million kilometers in Europe. More than 150 million people rely on inroads to help them conquer their drive and take back their time. With our partners and customers, we're doing more than reporting traffic. We're improving how people navigate their world. Because less time spent on the roads is more time spent with your loved ones. At Inrix, we're helping make your life a little better. So a little commercially, but um, I think it portrays actually a lot of information um, very quickly. So talk about the private sector provider traffic data. So again, the scope, you know, collecting information from over 100 million vehicles and providing services in 32 countries to 200 customers. So what, what does that mean? So, so one of the things that it means is that the type of visualizations that Rob showed, um, where he said you could take your data and you can put it in this visualization, if you don't have the data, right, we have the data for any of the roads in the US. And you can take our data and you can put it in Rob's visualizations. You actually don't have to go out and figure out a way to collect that data if you don't already have it. Um, if you already have some data and the data has some gaps in it, or you're looking for data to validate that data, again, that's the power of and, right? And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people miss as we think about this public-private sector play <coughs> Um, there's so much binary thinking that goes on, right, about should I have a, my own app or should I be harnessing commercial apps, right? There's not a downside really to doing both, right? There's some expenses, but they may not be huge. So each thing brings something else to the table, and I, so I just invite you to think about the power of Ann. We, I have a lot of conversations with people that have got vast sensor deployments and they're really reluctant to even talk to us. They know we're the cloud space guy, right? For outsourcing. We don't, we're not about having hardware on the roadway. What they don't think about is what would be the power of having a layer of information that told you to speed on every section of your roadway every minute and add that to what you already know. Um, pretty cost effective. You know, for the cost of two or three sensors, you can have data everywhere. So the, the topic now is mobile. Right? And so the thing to, to think about is that mobile is just part of the ecosystem. And, and it is a part where you notice in the ecosystem is a two-way arrow. Right? So one of, the, one of the things at Enrix, right, we're this cloud in the middle. And we hear a lot today about um, you know, um, B2B and um, B2I and, and those types of communications. But we really think that the future, and especially in the near term, is B2C and C2B and C to D and C to P, drivers and pedestrians, right? And people expect this information to kind of be ubiquitous, right? So they expect this information that the traffic management center knows to show up here and there, right? And so this cloud is the connection, and what we do is be the cloud and make those connections. And so again, if the agency wants to get their information out, as Rob said, if they post it out, just open, companies like Inrix and Google and TomTom, Tom and, and here there's several companies that will go out and lots of little small entrepreneurs that are building one-off apps and they'll grab that data and they'll make these connections for you. Right? So how Inrix does that is actually with a very powerful fusion engine. So this was the subject of Microsoft research and development, millions of dollars of research went into the original fusion engine to take data from hundreds of different of sources, and when I say a source, I'm talking about the PEM system that generates a data feed that is all the detectors in the state of California, we count that as one. That's one source, right? All of the sensors in Caltrans is a source of data. And then aggregate that with hundreds of other sources of information, so fleets that we have contacted with, um, and crunch that every minute and calculate a speed on every section of the roadway, um, plus have predicted algorithms to be able to push that out into the future. Um, and then pair that with other data 
that goes along with traveling, right? So parking information, um, incident information, and all of those things, and then tailor that to the different vertical markets of which one is mobile, right? But again, these things now really go more hand in hand. You're harnessing the same types of tools and information across the mobile and the internet, direct into the car, you know, public information, media information, and data for operation centers to be you know, more efficiently operating the roadway. On the auto space, and again, this is auto and mobile for us are really coming together. Because if you think about it, more and more, uh, the cars you buy today, your phone pairs with your car, right? And the same kind of information that's in your phone is in your car, and vice versa. And you want to be able to plan your trip on your computer or your mobile device when you get in your car, have that information transfer um, seamlessly, right? And then once you're in your car, well, we want to be able to pair up all these other kinds of data and be able to present that to the driver in a form that is not distracting, right? So there's a safety element here and thinking about how to add camera information as an example. And one of the things public likes to see to validate the fact that you're telling them it's congested head is a camera view. So is it possible to actually look up the camera view and put it on the big display in the car as, a, as the vehicle is approaching? Sure. I mean, those are the kinds of things that are coming. Um, weather warnings, you know, slick road ahead, those sorts of things. And then have that with, paired with parking information and fuel pricing and all the things that people have really come to expect. Uh, the busy commuter scenario, and, and this is a little bit of kind of what Rob said, where basically your car or your mobile device kind of figures out what you're up to. And um, it knows, well, gee, this guy left the house at 8 o'clock, and he does this a lot, right? <laughs> and typically when he leaves the house at 8 o'clock, he's heading to work. So let's tell him how long it's going to take to get there. Right? And oh, by the way, if there's a route that he should be looking at that is different than his or her normal route, let's tell her that too, <laughs> okay? Uh, you don't want to take your normal route today, right? You want to get off and go the back way today because there's a crash. So we know that as well. The mobile app, um, so again, the heart of mobile. Um, of course, we, we produce our own branded mobile app, but we're also the engine inside of many of the other popular mobile apps um, like MapQuest and um, MotionX. And, and again, it is a two-way situation now with the mobile app. Uh, the, um, of course, we produce this off um, all the four popular platforms, but the app now is a, has the ability to let the user input incident information. And so it's another thing that we're aggregating again. And so again, not just aggregating in one jurisdiction, but across continents. Um, so we have a dedicated team, actually, that does nothing but aggregate incident data for North America. And so we go out and we mine the incident information that DOTs are producing, like the California Highway Patrol feed. Um, then we add to it user-generated information, information from media partners, um, and then pull all that together and do a deduplication algorithm and then push that data back out and that becomes the incident icon on the map, right? So there might be an icon there if it was a CHP um, incident, but there might be an icon there where a user says there's a construction zone that's not noted or a crash that's not noted or maybe a crash that just, just happened. And, um, and more and more now, it's like the next thing we're launching is with our, with our data itself, we will actually launch a um, road closure alert because we see the data stop. And so places where the DOT doesn't even know that there's been a lane blocking crash yet, we'll throw up a road closed icon because we know cars aren't going by there anymore, and they should be. And so auto closures of the roadway. And that will be delivered mobile and um, on the internet um, as well. Um, what else is there? Oh, the prediction element. So again, one of the things we talked about now that's available through mobile is this time to leave. So on the mobile app, you can see the best route based on real-time traffic to get to your destination, but you can also um, ask it to give you the best route at, for your departure at some previous point in time. So say I want to leave here and get to the airport, um, but not, I'm not leaving now, I'm not going to leave till 4.30. Um, I can actually slide the slider bar forward to 4.30 and then see what we 
would have shown us the best route to leave at 4.30, or the two best recommended routes and estimated time of arrival. You can also program in a warrant or an alert to say, okay, I want to leave, um, I want to alert 30 minutes before I have to leave. So you can program that in and your phone is sitting there and all of a sudden on the flash screen it'll pop open just like a text message and it'll say, um, if you want to be to the airport by 4.30, you need to leave by such and such a time. And that will have appeared, that'll appear 30 minutes before the departure time that you have to go and then that's based on real-time traffic, you know, and the traffic that we predict there to be at your time of departure. And so those are all things that are built in today. And one of the things that's so kind of exciting about the mobile space and a little bit challenging if you're a mobile app developer is that um, the customers today expect that to change in six to eight weeks. <laughs> is that if you have apps, but the apps that you use, what do they do? Every few weeks you get an update with something new and cool in it to keep you engaged. And so that's another thing to think about if you're an agency and you're doing a mobile app and you're, you know, and if you're like the agency that I used to work in, you would spend weeks and weeks in a committee figuring out what you're going to do. In this space, you better be ready to do something new in six to eight weeks or your users will start diving off, right? And so, and again, even for us, that's a challenge. Right? Adding something new and cool every six to eight weeks um, is an effort. Um, so um, just a few examples of where the data is showing up and things that are connected now um, in a two-way relationship. So BMW North America um, is one of the customers who uses the data information. Audi was very interesting because Audi kind of showed the, the new paradigm in autos where um, automakers, their lead time to put in new products is quite long. You know, if you've worked with auto OEMs, you know that you've got to be planning way out, right? Well, that doesn't fit with today's technology, with this thing I was talking about where you have to be able to add new features. And so Audi has their connected driver information systems in their vehicles. They made a decision to add parking information in North America, and within a month, they rolled out the code and had it automatically downloaded into all Audis in the North America and added parking information um, because they actually just built a platform in, much like, uh, much like the iPhones, uh, the apps rolling right into the car. Um, Ford is one of our older auto customers. Uh, where we build our mobile app for them as well as provide the connected services for the Ford vehicles where you can talk to your car and ask it, how long is it going to take me to get home today? And it will. Um, tell you that, plus tell you the route that you need to take. Um, so again, that's all some um, information that's um, crunched by NRIPS. Um, the Toyota Intune platform. Um, and then an example of how to white label and easily embed the information. So many of you are familiar with AASHTO. Um, so AASHTO being the Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, when they put their app out, again, the primary purpose of that was to connect with their customers and deliver the AASHTO news. Right, so they wanted to be able to have folks have a handy way to dial in to the AASHTO messaging and the news clips of the day, but they thought being a transportation association, it would be kind of cool to have traffic information on there. So we provide a nationwide traffic layer for them. Well, it was really easy for that app developer to basically take our mobile developer kit and just tap our mobile APIs to add a mobile traffic layer to that app. So it's something you can add to any app. Um, if you think there's a traffic interest, right, that goes with your primary message, which is the actual purpose for pushing out your app. Our 95 Porter Coalition is our largest public sector association of customers, and again, the information there goes out in a number of different ways. You know, much of that making its way through 511 systems and out into the into the mobile devices, as well as being used in the traffic management centers. Um, where again they can see system-wide awareness based on the crowdsourced data, you know, some of which is being generated by mobile. One of the fun, fun things we did um, a year ago was push out some mobile information, some apps, some customized apps, and, and also customized information for the agencies that were managed traffic in and around the summer games in, uh, in the UK. We also are the voice of the BBC. So again, there is this traditional radio um, 
traffic information. Um, and so in the UK, we not only aggregate this information and develop the incident data set, we actually have the staff that reads the traffic reports that ends up showing up on the BBC across the, across the UK. So this is my last slide, just pointed in here because again, there is a lot of traditional infrastructure out there. So again, as we think mobile, one of the things that we can also think about is how do we better harness um, even some of the devices that we have out, the, out there today that are tried and true. So variable message signs, um, it's getting very popular to put travel times on those. And um, used to be that in order to do that, you had to put sensors on the roadway and collect data, aggregate that data to calculate the travel times and then put that up on the signs. Well, now you can simply come to us, tell us the route you want, and we'll set up an API for you to publish the travel times um, in real time without having to install any infrastructure. Right? And so this, this top sign up here for Snoqualmie Pass, you can see it's a very long corridor. Right? Um, and you put the sign up, um, we can basically light that up instantly without installing any infrastructure just by saying, okay, what's going to be the travel time from this sign to the top of Snoqualmie Pass? And then update that every three minutes. Uh, much more cost effective than going out and installing sensors um, 35 miles out of rural highway. So that is it, um, basically. Um, questions? Uh, in Quebec uh, province, the Ministry of Transportation, why not to use this kind of data for uh, calculate the, the travel time, but the problem they have is because they are public, they need to know the algorithm that we use to calculate it, so they can reproduce the, the result for at least some samples in the problems. Yeah, yeah so... Uh, are you able to provide this kind of information right. for a test to know how it works? Sure. So we, get, we run into that a lot, right? So I'm a civil engineer, and when I was going through school, I always had to show my work. Right? <laughs> it didn't matter if I had the, got the right answer. It's like, how do, how do you get the work? How do you get it? Well, the algorithms, first of all, are millions of lines of code, mm -hmm. and millions of lines, uh, millions of dollars of research, and um, more than a dozen patents for the fusion engine. So there's no way for me to show the work. Right? So you have, to, you have to do QA the way you would do QA, for example, on a steel beam. Right? You don't ask for the formulation of the steel. You see if it'll hold up. You put it in the lab and you stress test it. Right? Mm -hmm. And so the way you QA INRIX data is to ground truth test the results. You don't check the algorithm. Check the output. And you know, the University of Maryland has done independent evaluation of our data for the I-95 Quarter Coalition, probably the largest validation work that's ever been done on a data set. And I think they're approaching 50,000 hours of field data collection that they've done to validate our data. And I think the running number is now that overall, the NRX data matches the average speed within two and a half miles an hour when compared against field measurements and in unusual conditions that's as much as it's five miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So so a pretty good body of work to say that that this is accurate. And the other thing we will do is if customers, if we have a large customer that's going to use the real-time data like I-95, we'll include that validation as part of the QA process. And so much like DOTs do with other things, there is ways to test the outputs, but it isn't by reviewing the algorithms. Okay, but you can provide data for samples. Yes. So we can try to... Yeah. We're actually right now offering a free trial of the analytics platform. We have a national data set loaded into the platform that Michael Pax developed at the Cat Lab. And we're providing free logons of that for people to see the platform and view the data. Now it's not in Quebec, but um, you can pick some place in the US. We, we can show you the data there, though. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, what is the normal refresh rate that agencies seem to be comfortable with in terms of changing the travel time predictions on their VMS signs? So I see them either typically using a three minute or five minute cycle most often. Yeah, because they, they want it. There's two things, you know, just the routine to run the refresh, right? Um, and then having how often you want the number to change. 
you know, we, our algorithms recompute all the speeds on every link every minute, um, but then that's just sitting in the connected services environment, and so it's just whenever the, the DOT pings that, it returns whatever that current number is. So three or five minutes is what's most normal. Uh, one of this quick follow-up question. Uh, sometimes what happens is uh, there's situations where your travel time might be less than the time that somebody would take if they followed the posted speed limit on the roadway. So uh, sometimes for agencies that kind of like, you know, they mark the 65 mile per hour speed, the people are going 75 or 80. So the actual travel time is less than what you would do if you, so are you, told to kind of filter that by the agency and provide a value such that you never exceed what is the posted speed limit or the agencies just take care of it themselves? Yeah, so usually what the agencies will put their own cap in that, right? Okay. So our algorithm will return what the current speeds are running, but when they put the, the code in to actually translate that to the sign, yeah, okay. they'll have a minimum, right? So it's like a, if the number is less than X, we're going to post X, right? right? A bit of a niche question is uh, like in earthworks, you know, I have all trucks running from point A to point B maybe for six months. And uh, usually we just use an average assumption of the haul trucks, but with your information, it looks like I could estimate exactly how many haul trucks, how many loads I can get per day for six months. Is that feasible with your system? Yeah, it is. I mean, so we, we have historical data um, in two, two different formats, right? So one is the, as we calculate the speeds every minute on every segment, we save that data. So there's this running archive of recorded speeds, but then you can take and you really need a package like one of these two guys produce, right, to be able to um, then make sense of that as far as calculating travel times um, on a segment of road. but. It, both of their packages will actually take data like ours and do that. So you basically say, this is my route, and it'll give you the, you know, the travel time by time of day, um, you know, for typically for months, time slice or smaller. Uh, also give you like the planning number, so that's the 95th percentile. So that's your reliability metric, right? So you, then you've got the average, and you've kind of got the worst day of the month, right? And it's for the route, so you can not only assess you know, what's the average going to be, but how reliable is this? And, and do that by time of day, right? So then as you calculate your hauling, you can think, okay, in the morning, this is what it's going to take, midday, right? So you might think, okay, well, we want to run more trucks off peak, that kind of analysis versus trying to run lesser trucks, but run them longer and running them through the peak hours. So that's, you could absolutely make that assessment. And the data is just sitting there waiting for you to do that. Yeah, several years ago, I understand Inrix heavily rely on the uh, <coughs> feed or truck data as the main source of this uh, whatever product you guys do. Can you give us a uh, kind of update idea of what's the current status of the uh, you know, composition of your data source in terms of how much percentage are uh, coming to steal from the travel feed company versus you know, personal GPS or smartphone type of thing? Yeah, it's a good question. And so early on, the only vehicles that were connected and reporting in real time were the over the road haulers. Uh, and, they, and we still have a tremendous number of those reporting to us. And they're very cool because one of the things that they do that most fleets don't do is run all hours of the day on all roads. Right? So those are the folks that, when you're out in the middle of the interstate in the middle of the night, who's driving by? Right? It's a big truck. And, uh, and typically, if it's not congested, they're not going slow either. Right? Um, and so that's now gotten to be much closer to what the actual fleet distribution is. Because as we've signed more and more fleets even, the fleets now tend to be all size vehicles, right? Because fleets can be now, taxi cabs are connected, shuttle vans are connected of all sizes. And so it's still maybe slightly overrepresented, um, but it is, and it's market by market, um, but it's much closer to the, to the mix. And because part of, part of what's changed that is mobile devices are now contributing and then all these OEMs are contributing too. Bob? Um, just as you have a truck fleet component, you could have a bus fleet component. Are there any uh, bus companies, whether they're intercity bus or they're 
city transit buses either here in the U.S. or say in Europe or elsewhere, where you are, they're part of the data mix and you can report out their speeds independently of the rest of the vehicles on the network? Yeah. So, two things. First, I don't believe we actually have connected any of the bus fleets, um, more because they're not really enough vehicles to be of interest as a source. Right? We're really looking for sources that represent more vehicles than a typical bus fleet would have. And of course, they bring with them the extra complication of the, of the stops. And so I don't think we've ever done that aggregation. Um, and it, the only, the only um, vehicle type that we can break out at all is, is the large freight, freight, because we still know, you know some providers that are the freight um, versus kind of everybody else. And we only do that in one historical pilot. So we can't do that in the fusion engine. Uh, breakout types, everything goes in and then comes out the other end. So maybe what, one more question? I have a lost track down here. Do you have enough time? Okay. What a follow up. Um, parallel HOV lanes. Can you differentiate uh, the speeds on the HOV lanes versus the, the general purpose lanes? So right now it depends. Um, HOV lanes versus general purpose lanes. Um, up till now, we've been constrained by uh, map coding notice traffic, traffic message channel segments. And so if a, if a separated lane, a special purpose lane had its own TMC code, its own definition, then we could produce separate traffic on it. And it's because that's what we actually delivered on, right? That's our standard for delivery is TMC codes. Um, so that's, that's actually changing very soon in a couple of regards. One is um, we're going to have our own segmentations that we can use to where there's not TMC codes, we can assign codes. But the second thing we're going to start to do um, is look for dual speed profiles within a given segment. And so that actually applies for things beyond special use lanes. So if you think about off ramps that back up onto the main line, Right? And so if I'm actually going to take that ramp, my delay actually starts on the main line. Right? We can actually, we're going to start to look for those types of situations where we see in the data that the speed, that vehicles are moving at distinct different speeds. And then publish two speed profiles. And so some of the times that'll be a special use lane, sometimes that'll be off ramps, you know, that kind of thing. So, thank you.